All right, so here we are at the noon hour uh, central time, one o'clock Eastern. We're gonna move on to our next panel. Uh, we have uh, three amazing panelists participating on, on this next one. Um, our moderator is going to be a good friend of mine, uh, Yusuf Khan. Uh, you may be familiar with Yusuf from his website, uh, First and Pen. Dot com, which is uh, their mission is informing, inspiring, connecting through voices of color in sports. Uh, Yusuf is the former GM and senior vice president of the Shadow League, uh, another site you may be familiar with. He's former uh, advertising exec with ESPN. And in addition to his entrepreneurial and, and journalism work, he's an adjunct professor at Ryder University and Long Island University, uh, among others. So we'll invite Yusuf in here in a minute to uh, moderate our discussion. Uh, we have two Incredible panelists uh, joining Yusuf. First, uh, Michael Paul Williams, the columnist at the Richmond Times Dispatch, uh, a paper that he joined in 1982, became a columnist there in 1992, the first African American writer to hold that position as a columnist at that paper. In 2021, uh, Michael was awarded the Pulitzer Prize uh, for commentary for his writing about the protest movements in Richmond in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, leading to the removal of many Confederate uh, monuments there. So, uh, so excited to have a a Pulitzer Prize uh, winning columnist joining us today. And then we're also joined uh, by, I see you wearing the Tigers cap representing uh, Detroit, uh, Michael Eric Dyson, uh, distinguished uh, university professor here at Vanderbilt where he holds positions in both the uh, College of Arts and Science and the Divinity School. Uh, professor Dyson is a prominent public intellectual known for his insightful commentary on race, social justice and culture. He's written more than 25 books. So uh, something I really admire, I've written a couple, We've got a long way to go, uh, including seven New York Times bestsellers. He's won numerous awards for his literary works, including the 2020 Langston Hughes Medal and two NAACP Image Awards. Uh, we also wanted to acknowledge that Dave Zirin uh, was originally going to be a panelist uh, on this session. Uh, he has a, a family emergency and is uh, unable to join us, but he expressed uh, his best wishes to everyone. We're certainly thinking about Dave and his family today. Uh, but uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Yusuf, uh, take it away. All right. Well, guys, honored to speak to you both. Very, very honored. I uh, I see I got to get my um, book and poster collection up a little bit more because you guys got me beat there. So <laughs> I only had one. So I, I gotta I gotta step that up a little bit. So I'll make sure I work on that. But it's an honor to speak to to both of you, um, and I definitely appreciate you all for taking the time. And Andrew, thank you again for organizing this and involving me in this. Definitely honored to be a part of it. So let's get right into it. You know, one of the things that we um, or the main thing that we are going to be talking about um, is, is the situation with with John Morant and how it sort of um, encapsulates a, a whole issue that we have been facing with young black men, particularly young black athletes, um, and now as it relates to guns. So just to give everyone a little background, um, earlier this year, John Morant was involved over a five month period, you know, about a, a slew of some rough times. Um, back in February, he was accused of getting into an altercation um, in a mall with the security guard. Then a couple weeks later, he was involved at a pickup game in Memphis. And then came, obviously, the first incident in Colorado where he was accused of brandishing a firearm on Instagram Live. And that sort of set off all the things which we'll get into. So um, I'd like to start with you, Michael, if you will. Um, tell us a little bit about what your first thoughts were when the situation with Ja first came out, the video started to get released, and people started chiming in their different thoughts on you know, how he should be punished, if he should be punished, you know, what's the situation? Some people were saying, why are you even putting out the video of these guys, you know, privately partying? So, Michael, what was your initial reaction when you first uh, saw and heard about the incident? All right. Um, yeah, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I'm coming at this first as a basketball fan. I'm a huge basketball fan. And and second as a journalist. And I, I wanted on record that I was on the, um, the John Morant trained long before everyone else hopped on it back when he was in college i was saying he should have been picked higher than he was so i i mean i'm i'm here for his game but 
I had lost patience with mm -hmm. all the things that seemed to be going on in his life, um, um, the controversies, um, uh, the allegations involving the hunt, the guns, um, the situation with the teenager who was hooping in his on his property, which frankly disturbs me than any more than anything involving the guns. But when I started hearing about the punishments or the projected punishments, it, it seemed extreme. Uh, it, it seemed like a lot of things involving African Americans that is punitive. It, it seemed over the top for me. Um, I just didn't think the punishment fit the crime because no crime had been committed that he'd been convicted of. So it it it, it just seemed over the top, but also it seemed kind of on brand for the way um, the criminal, well, not just the criminal justice system, but just all institutions um, disproportionately punish um, Black people and particularly young Black men. Michael, Eric Dyson, since we have two Michaels, I have to make sure I separate the two. Um, you know, what were your initial thoughts? And uh, I'll actually add another question to that because you've written about hip hop as well as politics and civil rights, et cetera. And, you know, that that genre has its own issue with guns and things of that nature. So what were your initial thoughts, you know, when you first heard about the John Morant situation? Yes, sir. Well, I just want to say, first of all, it's great to be on the panel uh, with such brilliant uh, and wonderful men. Um, and of course, to be here with uh, Brother Andrew, uh, Dr. A.D. Lee, and uh, Dr. Shepard, uh, extraordinary colleagues. Look, um, I don't know what Brother Williams' age is. I just turned 65. So I got an official get off my grass black man card. All right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're on we're on the we're, same lawn. I'm we're, we're with you. We're with you, Michael. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm sporting my 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 Willie Horton jersey. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Number 23, went to Northwestern High School, hit a, a, a home run. He was 16 years old out of Tiger Stadium. I'm sorry. I just had to go there. Uh, with the Tigers and Bob Gibson came in 1968 and mowed down 17 batters, uh, but we still won the World Series. But they lowered the mound as a result of the fire and the heat that brother was throwing. However, <laughs> back to John ja Morant, uh, I don't know if I was quite as early as Brother Williams, but I was pretty darn early. And I knew that this man had extraordinary talent. I'm glad that <clears throat> Zion Williamson didn't turn into Greg Oden <laughs> so far. And, you know, John ja Morant is Kevin Durant, but John ja Morant is Kevin Durant. It, it, you know, if you look at the parallel there, in terms of the extraordinary physicality, the versatility, a young man. I mean, this is Allen Iverson on steroids, so to speak. Um, an extraordinarily entertaining and gifted baller and hooper. And, you know, so I'm a huge, huge fan and remain a huge fan. But the knuckleheadery, right? You, you, you got to be real about that, too. It's like, bro, you got hundreds of millions of dollars at stake. And if these are your boys, don't be on the video with you going, yo, yo, what's up? Look, bro, you need to rethink that. Don't do that. You got to have some no men, not some yes men. You got to have some no men or no people in your camp who will say to you who are officially granted the imprimatur, the official insignia of John Morant to say, Call me out when I'm being a jerk and let me know when I'm about to F up, all right? So that aside, um, I agree with Brother Williams that people were projecting all kinds of, you know, retaliation because people with real guns who have done real things have not necessarily received the same kind of um, stigma or punishment as, as John Morant. I'll give Adam... Silver credit of the NBA in the sense that he refused the command, put him out for a whole year, uh, be done with him, show that it's no tolerance. Uh, no tolerance is something that even conservative Black people put forward, but that's a notion that has been generated by people who want to kick us out of school. No tolerance. We have no tolerance for you and hurt us. So, no tolerance is a subliminally, if that, racialized concept that is geared toward African-American people. So we should never be down with the cancel culture and the no tolerance. That does not benefit us because that because there's always an exception. There will always be an asterisk and you ain't gonna be the one if your ass is at risk. 
Okay. Right. So, so the point is that I think that there was a balance. Thank God that Adam Silver didn't capitulate into the forces that Brother Williams was talking about to overpunish him, to stigmatize him, even with the second, you know, offense. And you want to go, bro, how, wh what's up? What are you doing? Uh, right. 25 games is rough, but it's far from being uh, what it might have been, what people were calling for in regard to him. And I just hope at the end of the day, he gets the help he needs. He gets the kind of commitment to his mental ill, mental health, as well as understanding that because you weren't a dude growing up in the hood like I was in Detroit, you ain't got to fake the funk. What we were trying to do in the hood is get out of it. Right. <laughs> like, if you want to be like the brothers in the hood, I know one day, bro, we're going to get out of here. As Jay-Z said, I don't want to be in the, you know, in the in the projects hallway talking about I'm in the ghetto, you know, project all day. It makes no sense to me. So yeah. hopefully he receives that kind of benefit. And, you know, it's funny you brought up it's funny you brought up Jay-Z because that was one of the quotes when I wrote the story on this when it first happened. You know, the quote I remembered from Jay-Z was I'll never make the news again. Right. Because you remember he got into that, that big issue with Lance on Rivera and there was a whole thing behind okay. it. But unfortunately, I don't know where this this sort of loss in lessons happens between generations. But Ja did not learn from one his mistake, but he did not learn from other mistakes, including athletic mistakes. Right. Because we saw in 2010, we had Gilbert Arenas, who brought a gun into the Washington Wizards facility. He was right. suspended 50 games and Javaris Critterton was suspended, I believe, was 38 games for bringing guns on NBA property, which is completely banned in the CBA. You cannot bring weapons onto NBA or team owned or operated property. So that should have been explained to him. So you mess up once you get eight games, you forfeited 700,000 of salary and your team lost in the playoffs. Now to think if that were me, I'd be like, damn, I think I just blew it. Let me just stop now. Right, right. A couple months later, what happens? Same thing. And it was like this quick, but it was caught, you know? So, where is the point, and, and Michael, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, come back to you. Where is the point, do we say that, you know what, these are young men making mistakes? Or when is it that we need to say, you know what, you need some real heavy dose of act right so that you will act right because you can't keep messing up? Michael, where, where is that point? Well, again, playing my senior citizen card right now. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm totally with Dr. Dyson on the hangers on, the so-called friends um, who will drag you and who have a lot more to lose than you do. Mm -hmm. But we continually let us, let them drag us down. Having said that, his father's a hanger on. I mean, you've seen, I mean, in the middle of all that, we have someone who's supposed to be that father figure. The one who's like, you know, if it's a father of my generation's dad saying, whoa, what the hell is wrong with you? Yeah. And 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 reeling them in. His father's in the middle of some of this stuff, which, you know, kind of points to me to some of the problem. You know, dad wants to shine in, in his son's light rather than being a dad, which is problematic. Right. Right. Um, as far as how we respond to this. I think it's kind of framed as a problem of young black men and their overzealousness over firearms. When um, the problem is the paraphrase phrase, I guess H. Rap Brown or whomever about violence being as American as cherry pie, guns are as American as cherry pie. Right. He's a product of America. He's not a product of hip hop or black America. He's a product of America and American gun lust and Americans glamorization of firearms. So it would be an anomaly for him not to turn out this way. Right. So, you know, and I, I like that that was addressed at some point, you know, that the politicians could go out here. We got a, a Lieutenant governor in Virginia who got us a black Republican Lieutenant governor who got herself, herself elected with an ad where she's holding an assault weapon. It, it's it's yeah. we 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 glamorize this, and then when younger people who are you know really aren't fully developed, uh, you know under twenty five is I think is where the point brain fully matures. But these are young people with a vast amount of money and and and, and far less sense, and far less life experience, 
and who who are the models? I mean, why should I guess my point is why should we expect any more? Right. Now, we'd like more, but in America, why should we respect expect any more? Given you know, the example that the nation itself sets with its gun laws, you know, it's 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 telling that he didn't break a law. Right. He right. he I think all agree he acted the fool with these guns, but did not break a law. It's it's hard to break a gun law in America. Yeah. And <laughs> and you know it's funny you said that. So in Colorado, where the police were investigating the first incident, you cannot carry a gun if you're intoxicated, but they couldn't prove that from the video. So he didn't break a law on that one. Then the Tennessee is an open car, you know, uh, permitless carry state. So he didn't break a law there. So technically, he's not in violation of any law or even on the NBA side. He didn't technically violate anything because he wasn't like Gilbert Arenas and bringing a gun onto an NBA owned or operated property. So, you know, legally, there's nothing there. But Michael Eric Dyson, I'll come to you because it's important to give historical context. Right. When I was researching for this panel, I had forgotten about the Mulford Act back in uh, Oakland with the Black Panther Party. And how, you know, at the time, Governor Reagan had signed into law this act, which basically targeted the Black Panther Party from carrying weapons and patrolling Oakland streets, keeping everyone safe. Right. So if we look at something like that, what Michael just said about, you know, America's fascination with gun guns and gun, you know, gun laws or gun control or open carry, whatever you want to call it. But it only seems like it's open for certain people. Right. Not for everybody. And I think that's an important point, especially as it relates to John Morant, because he, like the Black Panthers, did nothing illegal, but they right. went and found a reason to punish both parties for it. So if you could talk a little bit about how the past has now come back to present. Right. No, it's a great point. Two things. First of all, yeah, he didn't break the law, but I'm sure all of these contracts have these morals clauses. Mm -hmm. right? So you ain't got to break the law in order to break the brand. Right. in order to sully the reputation. Reputational harm is a metric, not only of your Q rating, which is which is important, right? They're looking at LeBron, you know, LeBron still rates high. But can, can we stop for a minute? I mean, a 38, about to turn 39 year old man out there showing them young boys what it is. Yes. Okay, I just yes. had to say it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tyrese Halliburton, you're on the up, you're on the come up, you, you, you balling bad, but LeBron James, Yes. Had to show you what time it is. But anyway, <laughs> back to the lecture at hand. So the reality is reputational harm as a metric of defensible punishment is something that the, the CBA and the league, they all argue over and back and forth. But they understand that it ain't about because black people say it wasn't, you know, cops who didn't break the law because of how they constructed it still be making us angry because you're still doing something immoral. So that line between what's legal and moral has often not benefited us, let's be real. Uh, but at the same time, we understand the difference there. So the NBA can argue that it's acting in behalf of protecting right. its brand and protecting its shield, as the NFL would call it. God have mercy. And the difference between that and what breaking a legal, um, um, a, a legal line, crossing a legal line would be. Number two, though, right. Are, are you kidding me? Guns. They think the second amendment is the second commandment. They think Moses is coming down from on high. Thou shalt be able to carry a gun. And we, we know the arguments. They were talking about muskets. Benjamin Franklin didn't have no automatic weapon. Thomas Jefferson didn't have a gat, right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson was too busy writing notes on Virginia and pursuing a 14th, well, so, so the reality is talking about breaking some laws, <laughs> talking about offending some social practices, right? But there was no Me Too movement on the slave plantation. So the reality is guns, as Brother Williams has indicated that H. Rap Brown, Amer violence is American as cherry pie. The wielding of guns, they are proud. People running for Congress wielding real guns mm -hmm. with power to do real damage are celebrated. Where was the NRA in defense of John Moran? I ain't seen them. I ain't seen where they is. I, I didn't see the NRA coming up saying this is an inappropriate offense to a vulnerable citizen wielding his firearm as a legally 
a justifiable citizen, justified citizen. Ain't nothing because we know the real issue here, as you indicated, Brother Khan, is the fact that when Ronald Reagan saw the Negroes with guns, right? That's a great book. Go read that gun, Negroes with Guns, about Robert Williams in North Carolina because black folk didn't put it on Twitter, young people. I am not my ancestors, right? I'm, I'm chasing a little rabbit here. No, you ain't, because your ancestors didn't go out and do nothing with no gun and then put it on, on Twitter or Facebook. Now, I know they didn't exist then, but you get my point. They didn't publicize it. Uh, as 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 Biggie said, bad boys move in silence. Uh, but I don't want to extend that to the owner of the record company right now. So the point is <laughs> that we are seeing the 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 political machinations that associate themselves with color. And when black people do stuff that white folk take for granted, we never quote can get away with it. So there's an extra black tax associated with the offense to begin with. And John ja Morant certainly, despite the legitimate critiques that can be leveled his way, including when your father's on your payroll, that's different, right? Because Michael Jordan's daddy had reared him, put him in a line, made him obey certain covenants and rules and had reinforced that. So by the time he was on the payroll too, he still had a fatherly and familial authenticity and authority that may not happen when you 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old having children. I'm saying that myself because my son is 45 right now, about to turn 46 and I'm, I'm 65. So I'm in that teen father category. So I know of which I speak. There's a shift in authority and relationships. So yeah, it's horrible. They come up with the rules and the legal precedents when it comes to black people. There's always an exception. There's always an asterisk. And unfortunately, John ja Moran extends that tradition, but you got enough at stake and enough people around you to say, bro, to explain that to them. And I'll end by saying this, this is the importance of folk like a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, a tremendous author and writer here. Y'all, it's important that those black athletes are divorced and divided from the common sense that could be gleaned by elders in our community, because in school they tell them, don't take Dyson's class. When I was at University of North Carolina, he's a radical, so that the athletes still found their way to my class, and I put them on game, but there is a conscious intent to divorce and divide those athletes from a history and tradition that could inform them about why they are now, where they are now. Because there's a difference between social service, cleats, these are my cleats, these are my stories. That's one thing, it's beautiful. When you're talking about your mama being a, a victim of domestic violence, when you're talking about going to a hospital to help people out, but there's a difference between social service and social justice, which is why LeBron was demonized when he spoke on behalf of you know a young man wearing a hoodie, Trayvon Martin, as opposed to building a school for young black people. So, Michael, let me come back to you on on this, because um, um, we just talked about, you know, a lot of the sponsors, a lot of sponsors just got mentioned. And this is an important thing for young athletes to remember. I mean, college athletes are just going through it with NIL. It's only been around for, you know, basically less than three years right now. But at the pro level, if we look what happened to John Morant, Nike pulled his sneaker, Powerade pulled his commercial. He lost um, $700,000 with the first suspension. That was just in gameplay. And then the second one, he lost even more. So now you're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars. So where is the point, Michael, you had brought up his father, right? Being a part of his, his family. Where is the point, even as a father, you're like, what are you doing? If you don't want to do it just for the sake of, you know, being a role model, look at your bank account right now, right? So where is that point where we say, from a brand perspective, a, a sponsor's perspective, you need to get your stuff together. Here's the point where um, the situation with, with Crittenden and, and, and Arenas was brought up earlier. And um, I wonder how much the athletes even know about the history of their own games. Not much, unfortunately, yeah, and, and not that's, much. And that's, that's all, it's, just, it's, it's destructive. Yeah. The ignorance about their own profession and the history of their own profession is 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 problematic. Um, 
the the NBA is is all of us on this panel know was on a precipice back in the 1970s where it was endangered because of the perception that it was a black game mm -hmm. and at some point um it, you know the Portland Jail Blazers do you remember them they were yeah. No, you know, they were they were black. It was a game filled with black criminals. Mm -hmm. And the NBA is very aware of, of that imaging problem. It still haunts them. Yeah, you know, and the New York the New York blanker bockers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want I didn't want to go there. You well, know I know that. If if I can interrupt you for one minute, I'm gonna give you a personal example. When I was at ESPN, I was part of the team that brought the NBA over in 2002. And this is a true story. I haven't really shared this with anybody, but I'll, get, I'll tell this to you guys for context. When we were presenting to the entire sales team, it was about 100 people in the room, senior execs, everyone was there. And, you know, we just had spent $2.4 billion for a six-year deal with the NBA. Biggest deals, massive thing. We're getting the finals, all these different things. And remember, this was at the time when they're transitioning from Bird, Magic, and Jordan to now Iverson and Weber and a lot of these guys. They don't know how to market them yet. So we're talking, we finish presenting, and one of the, the executives, you know, raises his hands and says, this is a true story. I can't sell the MBA. Now we're in the advertising department. So the head of my department looks at him and says, what do you mean you can't sell it? We just spent $2.4 billion to get it. And this is what he said. I can't sell corn rolls and tattoos. And I will always remember that because what, just like you said, perception really matters in this is sports industry, unfortunately. And you see how long it took the NBA to get to that next level. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Go ahead. I didn't mean Dr. to interrupt Dyson, you, Michael. Dr. Dyson bought up Ja and and, and, and Kevin Morant. I mean, Kevin um, Durant. Durant. I see Ja as, as Iverson 2.0. Oh, yeah. No doubt. Mm -hmm. no, no yeah. doubt. The attitude, the hair, the game, and, and the drama. Yeah. On steroids, and, on steroids. That's what I said. On steroids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then you know there are situations like the malice, the malice at the palace. Mm -hmm. You know we recall that where, you know these players got big suspensions that were, you know all that stuff dropped on them. And I finally saw a documentary maybe a year or two ago that just laid out how the fans got pretty much got off scot free who incited the whole thing, mm -hmm. the, the person who threw the beer down at. It, it, it just, it just, never, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just, so you can't, as a young athlete, you've got to know this history. You've got to know that you're not going to get the benefit of the doubt, that all the baggage of this history is, is, is not in your favor. Um, and that if the league has Steph Curry and Michael Jordan and, and LeBron. And even, I mean, even Shaquille is on the commercials. So Shaquille is our age, basically. And he's on more commercials than I can. They don't need a problematic 23-year-old yeah. with a history. Yeah. They've got plenty of, of athletes, basketball players, past and present, that can sell the game for them. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just a stupid move financially. Yeah. Professor Dyson, I'm going to come to you in a second. There are two things I wanted to bring out because we talked about Arenas and Crittenden. There were some other cases that were that made that punishment of 25 games look hypocritical. Um, Miles Bridges got 30 games for domestic violence charges in this past April. In 2014-15, Jeff Taylor got 24 games for misdemeanor uh, domestic violence and malicious destruction of hotel property. So now you got you see guys who are actually involved in physical abuse getting almost the same amount of games as John Morant got for not violating or breaking a law, but more so embarrassing the, the league, right? The, the emblem. Right. And so, Professor Dyson, I want you to talk about the hypocrisy that goes into that sort of punishment. And then I want to come back to you to talk about Teen Father and Mikey Williams, because I think that's another incident People haven't addressed as heavy as John Morant's, but I think it does deserve um, some some addressing. So I'll leave that one to you about the domestic violence charges versus where we are with John the hypocrisy. Well, it's as a society, right? We you know, the NBA is probably more progressive than the NFL, right? But the NFL has gotten its you know 
uh, has been forced, let me put it that way, uh, to address this, as all leagues have, because women's lives have not meant much in the world of sports. Even, you know, we look at the disparity between what's the what's the highest a WNBA player can get? I don't know, 100, 200,000, 237, yeah. 237,000. Is that the top player? The, Candace Parker is probably making $7 million a year on endorsements mm -hmm. as opposed to 200 grand there. This is why Brittany Griner has to go to Russia and hang out in the off season to make a million or two to supplement her income. So we know the disparity. The violence against women is not simply domestic, it's, it's entrepreneurial. It's at the conceptual level of how sports play out in America and more broadly, uh, the disparity between the wages of women and the wages of men. So across the board, you're right, the hypocrisy is stunning. So when it, it's no surprise that when it comes to um, the assignment of punishment, in whatever sport we're speaking about, that women's lives have not mattered as much as property. Heck, Michael Vick, do I need to say anymore? Went yeah. to prison, mm -hmm. to prison. Now I, I grew up with dogs, you know what I'm saying? And, and I had a British bulldog, so that was some evil stuff, I ain't gonna lie, but dog. Are you telling me that white Southern guys who've been fighting dogs forever and ever, and who did certain things didn't get you know, caught up in the same way and didn't get the same kind of punishments and so on and so forth. So, or the disparity between crack and powder. Because when you're doing powder cocaine, you're usually a white executive in the upper echelons of the office. Ain't no police gonna come up to your building on the 25th floor. But if you're in a crack house, the physical geography of your criminality and your offense makes you more vulnerable as a result of that. So you're absolutely right. The hypocrisy across the board is stunning and we've got to address that in the NBA, in the NFL, in the hockey leagues, in the major league baseball. I mean, um, it's extraordinary and needs to be uh, addressed. I think, again, for John ja Morant, I think Brother Williams is absolutely right as a kind of Iverson figure. And Iverson says, I had to get my butt beat. Now LeBron, now every player, cornrows, and you can't sell cornrows and tattoos? Like you said, bro, <laughs> then you ain't gonna have those, right? Carmelo, uh, I mean, every, mostly every, even even Kobe <laughs> had to yeah. go and get, uh, uh, you know, the, the tattoo in the aftermath of his domestic uh, intranquility. Mm -hmm. So the point is that that you're absolutely right. The gender issue is central, is dominant, represents hypocrisy. But when gender and race are joined together, the hypocrisy is even more amplified. Yeah. And I want to stay with you for a second to talk about Mikey Williams, because to me, this was a story that kind of was not swept under the rug, but it wasn't talked about maybe because he's a high school player. But I think it's just as important to talk about because he's a younger person, right? He's more susceptible to influences and things around him. And if you remember, he got arrested for five charges of, I think it was an armed felony, if I'm, I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And just recently, I think it was about two weeks ago, he pled guilty to it. And now he just has to do some community service and anger management. But that could have ruined his entire life. Oh, man. I mean, he could have served 35 plus years at the age of 17, 18 years old, you know, and now his sort of status is it's negatively impacted to when he goes to Memphis, you know, Penny Hardaway has no clue when he's going to be able to come to school. Right. And now we, we talk about the brands. Does his NIL money get affected because brands don't necessarily want to be, you know, near him. So, you know, you had mentioned teen father before, you know, here he is, he's a teen. He is the number one recruit in the nation and he has a gun charge too. And this time he was accused of firing it, unlike Ja. So tell me your thoughts on, on Mikey Williams and where do we go, you know, especially as parents with, with children that we have to let them know, listen, you cannot be involved in this particular if you're at that level of athletic greatness. It's so true. And it is, it's a paradox, right? Because of your blackness, socially considered and constructed and viewed in the culture, the NBA <clears throat> is what? Black guys and a bunch of European white guys. The American born white man needs a Larry Bird exception to get in the game. <laughs> let's, let's, we, we gotta work, we gotta go recruit some American born white guys because the Donchiches and the yoke jokers and so on are balling out of their minds and they gotta, but they've been playing since they've been 15. Yeah. Because black boys, if we talk about men, 
in America are stigmatized. Oh my God, you don't want to be educated. You just want to go play ball. Luka Doncic has been a professional since he's been 15. And he's there. in Europe and he's glamorized. And I love Luka. Luka's a baller, one of the greatest that we've seen uh, in this game. But there's a different standard applied to even when Luka could begin to play. If you want to play over here, you got to go to college one year and so on and so forth. They're probably going to reject that pretty soon. But the point is there's a stigma associated with black athletes in ways that white athletes from Europe don't endure. So when you look at that <clears throat> and you look at the fact that he's a young man, as Brother Williams already said, these are these are kids. Yes, he's got a gun charge. He's 17. The, the paradox is, on the one hand, your blackness works in your behalf in terms of a sport that we've dominated, but it works against you in terms of the kind of stigma that will be associated with you, and you will be seen as preternaturally criminal, an inveterate, you know, uh, mess-upper who's going to continue to bring harm to the program. And your, is your NIL money? Yep. But I'll tell you, winning covers a multitude of sins. And so what we've got to do is to balance out telling these young people, bruh, you're not a white guy. You're not going to get the same benefit of the doubt. I wish it was different. I wish we could make it more complicated and nuanced than that. The bottom line is you are still in the public eye seen as an overwrought, overpaid, overcompensated, spoiled, rich athlete who is undeserving of the fundamental premises of justice in this country. So you have to be especially, you've you're got tremendous advantage and tremendous benefit, but you also have to have tremendous consciousness. I'll end by saying this, you know, Popovich brought me in about a month ago, maybe not, uh, to speak to the Spurs. Now every coach ain't Popovich, right? Popovich is like, don't lie, don't hold back. Talk about race, talk about differential perception, speak about these issues. Man, if we had like five pops <laughs> in the league, yeah. it, you know, and his name is Pops. If we had pops who were like pops <laughs> who could who could cuss him out, I was gonna say at one point, I'll send my son to you. You can cuss him out all you want, bro. And and I'll joke with him. I said, You're not treating these people like you did Tony Parker. <laughs> right? no. You were a Tony. What are you kidding? Who are you? I don't even know you, bro. You, you Tony Parker, uh, Ginobili, uh, even Tim. D you were on their A double S, bro. Who are you? He said, Professor, it's a different generation. You got to treat them differently. But when you look at Wimban Yama, I mean, an extraordinary kid who's 19, but he's an outlier. The kids born in America who are black, who have been disadvantaged by the same issues that other black young people have been disadvantaged by are gonna be subject to the same temptations, except now the glare of the spotlight highlights them in a way that makes them even far more vulnerable. So I think you're absolutely right. We gotta, we gotta talk to them. We should have programs. I spoke to the rookie class of LeBron, right? And those figures, I think Carmelo and, and CP3 and so, well, he might have come later. So, and, and Dwayne Wade. And I'm telling you, if the NBA union could get a program where we speak directly and honestly, the point you were making, Brother Khan, what's the history? What's mm -hmm. the tradition? What have athletes been subject to? What kinds of charges have they endured? What did Crittenden and, although they were wilding out, they were actually talking yeah. about killing each other and doing it. I mean, they, 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 they were tripping, right? I went to uh, get 10 years to become a fan and a, a, a seat holder uh, for the Wizards 10 years after that when I was at Georgetown. So I, I came right after that and saw it. And I've spent three years on the floor looking at Allen Iverson at his height. So I know that these issues make a difference. But now the NIL is uh, uh, at stake and this endorsement money. And we're not trying to be reductive capitalists. We are saying that is the basis of your generational wealth and your ability to take care of your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids. And we have to give them those lessons. And Michael, I'll come back to you on that because you had said that you were on John Morant from when he was not even being recruited because everyone knows his story. He happened to be in the other gym when they were recruiting somebody else on his team and the assistant saw him dunking and all these things, you know? So where is the responsibility of not just the parents, right? Not just the coaches, but as we, as we grew up, all of our, you know, us AARP folks here in this room, how do we say we need to bring back that community to talk to these kids because they are growing up much faster than we did. And there is more opportunity to get in trouble with less 
common sense than what we had, unfortunately. So, Michael, where do you find those talents and how do you talk to them now um, to help them so that they don't get into the problems that Mikey Williams and John Moran have faced? Yeah, I mean, every um, every community um, where basketball is played has or traditionally has had elders, coaches who functioned as elders, um, probably of our generation or older, who held that sort of sway and, 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 could, and could have that sort of influence. Um, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but that doesn't seem to be happening as much. Maybe the money has made it harder um, to, nav to navigate in that space because there's just so much money out there for them, even before they go pro, the NIL stuff. Um, what I would like to say is I would hope that the league could play a role in this. I, I view this as a social justice issue. And I would hope the league would move beyond um, the punitive and some of the maybe performative or virtue signaling aspects of social justice. Um, why couldn't this have been a moment when the league moved to the forefront against gun violence? Um, gun violence... I mean, to be real, is exacting a horrific toll in our community. And yeah. you live in a city like Richmond. There are children. There are, are this is high school students, middle school students, children who are are, are being killed. Um, we had a situation where a six-year-old boy in Newport News shot his teacher in yeah. a classroom. Didn't kill her, but shot her. Took his mother's gun from home and shot her intentionally, it would appear. Yeah. So you would have hoped this would have resulted or will result in a conversation in our community about guns because we're all feeling some kind of way about guns. We feel less safe. And I, I know the brothers who belong to the gun clubs and, but the second amendment was never intended for us. Right. So there's that double-edged sword where Philando Castile yeah. gets killed because he legally owns a gun. And it, it happens a man in a Walmart in Ohio gets killed handling a gun. Yeah. that he's thinking of purchasing by the police. So there's always that double standard. And we've got to learn. I mean, you would hope the league would have workshops, would, would go public with the idea that we've got to develop a relationship with guns in a nation that worships the gun that doesn't lead to our destruction. Mm -hmm. um, just talk about responsible gun ownership, how this gun ownership and the way we handle the guns can destroy a career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I I know Andrew. We're probably getting ready to uh to wrap up a little bit, um. You know, but I wanted to to bring up one thing that I noticed, um, Professor Dyson. You mentioned that Coach Pop had spoke out, said, you know, speak honestly, speak, you know, don't hold back. It's interesting that only two coaches have been voices or vocal against gun violence. Obviously, Coach Kerr who obviously his father was murdered, um, and then Coach Pop. Yeah. Not many other coaches have really taken on that issue. And it's really interesting to me because at any moment, any of their players are susceptible to it. And no one else has talked about it but those two. And they keep going back to them. You know, talk about this incident. And I know Coach Pop is probably sick of talking about it because we shouldn't keep going through it, right? Another mass murder has happened. It's like, oh, I got to speak on guns again, right? You know, why do you think, and, and Professor Dice, I'll, I'll put this to you since you just spoke to them, why do you think coaches are so reluctant to speak out when their players are the majority of the ones who can be targeted or victimized by gun violence? Especially black coaches. Let's yes. just be real. Yeah. Now, black coaches know that they ain't pop. I'm right. not Dave Kerr. I mean, Steve Kerr. So I can't. I can't speak in the same way. And Pop is conscious of that. What I love about Pop, he understands his white privilege and uses it to the hilt to undermine white privilege, right? He understands that he has to speak out consistently. And trust me, I spoke to his staff and everyone, hey, should we, should, should we continue to support Pop? Should Pop continue to? I say, stay on it. I said, because he's, one, he's a voice, yes, in the wilderness, but he is heard. And when he speaks, he's like E.F. Hutton, people listen because he's got six chips. Or is it five? Six. No, five. Five. And five. Five. Kobe, Kobe's got five. Jordan has six. Yes. Okay. So, so he's got five chips 
He's got, you know, from David Robinson to Tim Duncan to Ginobili to Parker, now to Wimbenyama and so on. So the man is produced, but he uses his privilege in a way. Steve Kerr, because of an existential plight of his father being victim of terrorism and of gun violence, uh, can speak out. But I think that those others, uh, I'll just even be more, I don't think that they'll mind me saying this. At When I was in, uh, in San Antonio, we had a dinner that night <clears throat> with Mike Breen, myself, Doc Rivers, and some folk from the uh, from the Spurs. And Doc was referring to, he said, when he had the Donald Sterling thing, and he says, you sent me, talking about me, you sent me a text and told me that why is it that the people who are the greatest victims of this violence, racial violence, have to be the ones to be held to account as opposed to white people who are complicit in the very structures that disadvantage black people. Now, so I'm saying that the reason the pops and the curs speak out is because they got white privilege. Also, I think that those white coaches who are who are in charge of, who are coaching these young black people see it from the very beginning, but don't have the political instincts, don't have the political maturity, or sometimes don't have the commitment. Look at Tommy Tuberville, just to go out of line here. Here's a guy who coached, you coach black people every day. You saw what was going on. And he is one of the most right-wing, reactionary, racist, I would add, and I'll stand by that, uh, senators who has done great and grand destruction to an institution, and he worked with black people every day. So you would think, but however, that, that's in football, even though the NFL is what, 69% black? The NBA is 80% black. So you're talking about dominant, racialized quarters of athletic pursuit. So I think that some of them are afraid because they don't want to you know, lose their stature. They don't have the stature of a Kerr or a, a Pop. Some of them feel that, you know, are we going to run contradictory to our owners? Because Pop is not only the coach, he's the GM, I think, right? Or whatever, you know, the head. Uh, and Steve Kerr has tremendous capital. And uh, the like-mindedness of owners of governors, whatever they call them now. So the point is that I think uh, it's a much more mixed bag. It's a greater risk to speak out. Uh, a LeBron James will speak out, shut up and stop, you know, keep dribbling, shut up and dribble, whatever. The point is that it is a risk even for those coaches. But I think at this point, the violence is so deep and the players who have been disadvantaged as a result of it, that is not only themselves, but their communities have to bear the burden of this, unfortunately, even more than the coaches, they have greater latitude, ironically enough. They can go on Twitter and say things that the coaches can't necessarily do. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Andrew, but I have one final quick question for you both. Michael, last word. John Morant is coming back in probably around four or five games if he can, can you know, uh, finishes the program he's supposed to finish. So let's assume he does and comes back in the next five games. Quick prediction, Michael. How does he do? Does he get the welcome that he should, or does his season go, you know, the other way? I think he gets the welcome um, that he should because they're losing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they they will welcome him back <laughs> with ovations. I'm sure, especially if they start winning again. It's that's what it's all about here. Yes, it's about winning. I said winning will cover a multitude of sins. Deshaun Watson. Yeah. <laughs> if you could say, although Joe Flacco, old man, here's the theme, old man, yeah. we're saving you. We're on our couch three weeks ago. Then I'm yeah. throwing touchdowns and bombs at you now. I think that, look, I think he'll be uh, the recipient of grace. I think that people will be pulling for him, but I hope it encourages him to really have done some serious introspection and get a team around you that can prevent you from doing stupid stuff. Look, we got an orange apparition that's in his 70s out here wrecking the nation, right? <laughs> uh, John Moran ain't yeah. the problem. Is anyway, yeah. so uh, <laughs> let me say that, right? So, so I think he'll uh, I'll think he'll be re uh, received well. And look, he's going to be explosive. After five or six games, get his legs under him again, 10 games. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be like old times. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, I truly enjoyed speaking to you both. Um, definitely look forward to doing this again, Andrew, whenever you have it. Thank you again for having us. Uh, Michael, Michael, thank you again for the time and the great conversation. Truly appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. What an honor and a blessing. Thank you.